God has actually called us to start this journey that I call discovering the Holy Spirit. And we're going to begin to teach on the Holy Spirit right out of Scripture. How many of you believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the Word of God? Amen. We're not going to ask you to accept anything that's not in here. Hallelujah. And we're going to take you through, I uh, don't know how long it'll go. Uh, it, it, I, have a, I have a notion that it'll be months. But we're going to teach on every Sunday, we're going to teach about the Holy Spirit. And until and you get to the place where you are hungry to be fully integrated with him, immersed in, pickled in, baptized in the Holy Spirit so that, so that great things can you do in this season that we're in. Turn to Genesis chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And stand for the reading of the word, if you would. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift this word up to you and we thank you and we praise you that it brings life, that it brings uh, healing to us, that it delivers us but only if it's activated by the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, uh, we don't say come because you're already here. And the reason you're here is because we're here and you're in us. So we don't have to invite you to come. We just give you the uh, full, we just submit to your leadership and we ask you to do whatever you need to do in this service this morning to set us free and heal us and bring life in our situation. And we just... Uh, ask you, Lord, to anoint this word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Genesis chapter 8, this is the story of Noah. It says, then God remembered Noah, every living thing, and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. He must have landed in West Texas somewhere, amen, hallelujah. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from the heaven was restrained, and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. And then the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventh day of that month, on the mountains of Arat. <coughs> Excuse me. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass that at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. And he also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned to the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand, and he took her, and he drew her into the ark to himself. And... He waited until another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him with, with it in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. May God add his blessing in the reading of the word. You may be seated. There are three dispensations of the Holy Spirit and that are biblical and we're going to discuss those this morning and we're going to start out with the old testament typology now types is a fascinating concept it means that there are things in the old testament and and this is a number one reason to read the old testament if you're a new testament believer because the old testament points towards christ amen and it gives you clues about his ministry and how it works and 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 the lord uses typology in other words things that have symbolism that convey deep spiritual truths. You see, you and I have one fundamental problem. Our mind is not big enough to comprehend the kingdom of God fully and the power of what he does. I don't think you will ever be able in this life to clearly understand everything about the kingdom of God. Do you believe that? If you believe that, say amen. We just don't have the mental capacity to do that. So God, often Jesus would do this. He would use symbolism to try to teach us. He would take a symbol out of the natural to try to teach us a spiritual concept, to try to get us to understand in a, in a way deep down in our spirit. Spiritual revelation, and we're going to talk about this next week, but spiritual revelation is not understanding with your logical mind. Spiritual revelation is intuitive understanding of truth. Let me say that again. Spiritual revelation is intuitive understanding of truth. You don't know why you know, you just know. Jesus Christ, uh, for example, Jesus Christ died 2,500 years almost, 2,000 years ago for me on the cross. But for the first 33 years of my life, that wasn't a spiritual truth in my life. 
He died for me, but it didn't become truth to me until I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit convinced me that I was a sinner, and I needed a Savior, and Christ was it. And in that moment, in that moment, this truth that had been in the universe for 2,000 years became real in my life. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's the teacher. Amen? So this is the importance of understanding the dispensations of the Holy Spirit and the typology. The Bible's full of typology. The tabernacle types your spiritual journey from the outer courts to the holy place to the most holy of holies. The ark itself is a type of a wooden form of redemption which types the cross of Christ. It's interesting that the word, when, G, when God was telling Noah to build the ark, he said, paint it, build it out of gopher wood and paint it with pitch <coughs> as a sealant. <coughs> <coughs> That pitch, the word for pitch is a Hebrew word, also means atonement. So there's all kinds of typology in the ark itself. Seven, the typology of numbers in our, in our MTI course on typology is our most popular, popular course. We teach on all of the, the types, seven types, what? The end of a cycle or completion, right? Ten types judgment, three types the Trinity, nine types the Holy Spirit. So gold types uh, the presence of God, silver type salvation, brass types judgment. If you understand these types and you go and you read the, these strange stories in the Old Testament, they begin to make a little bit of sense to you. Amen? So I want to talk about the type for the Holy Spirit here chosen by God is the dove. In Luke 3.22, Jesus went down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. He came out of the water just like Sister Micah did just a minute ago. And the Holy Spirit, it says, descended bodily in a bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The type of the Holy Spirit is the dove. Now it's interesting here in the story of Noah, we see the three dispensations of the Holy Spirit through time. Genesis 8 and 9. Noah sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground, but the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put all out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark himself. Now this, testimates, tes this testifies to the Old Testament dispensation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was around in the Old Testament, but not active like he is now. He was hovering over the earth, it says in Genesis. But he had not, light, he had not lit on the earth yet. He was moved through men that were prophetic. There were great prophets, a handful. Think about this. All the hundreds of thousands and millions of people that lived from the time of Adam to the time of Moses or from the time of Jesus. And only a handful of men had the anointing to prophesy, to have a word of knowledge, to speak healing and direction. These were the prophets of God. The Holy Spirit was active in them, but not active in anyone else. This is the type. The dove, the dove went and hovered over the earth, but came back to God. The resting place was not ready because the judgment of God was still on the face of the earth. This is the typology. Then in Genesis 8, 10, and 11, he waited yet another seven days. Seven days is the number of completion of a cycle. In other words, you might say, uh, it says in Matthew, it says that there are 14 generations from, from Adam to Noah and 14 generations from Noah to, and there's a cycle. God is operating history on a cycle. And Noah waited to the end of this first cycle of the Old Testament revelation. He released the dove again, and again the sent, and he sent the dove out of the ark. And the dove came to him that evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew what the waters had, that had receded from the earth. The olive branch types the peace offering. This is what it says in Ephesians 2, 15 and 17. The cross of Christ reconciles us to him, having abolished in his flesh Enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the, from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you from afar to those who were near. We were enemies of God until we got saved. We had no peace with God. We were opposite of God. But Christ made a way through the gospel and the cross for us to be reconciled back to God and for us to have peace. How many of you remember the peace you got when you first got saved? Come on, somebody. Oh, my goodness. Something in your heart. All those burdens you'd been worried about. You just all of a sudden had peace with God and you knew that God loved you. 
This type of the Holy Spirit represented in Genesis 8, 10, and 11 types the gospel, Jesus' earthly ministry, and the gospel being released on the earth. The, uh, the dove, the Holy Spirit, came back with the olive branch. There was a peace now between God and man that was not there before. And then finally, the final dispensation of the Holy Spirit incarnate. Jesus talks about this in John. Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. This is the last dispensation. I'll read you back the passages from Genesis chapter 8. It says that Noah sent out the dove and it did not return to him. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to live on earth in us. No longer was he hovering over the earth no longer was he part of the process of reconciling us to God. God had come to live incarnate in us. This is the final dispensation of the Holy Spirit. This is what God and Jesus told them in John 14. He said, it's better for you that I go so that he will come. Let's start in verse 12. Actually, let's start in verse 10. John 14, verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. How did Jesus do the miracles? How did he raise the dead? How did he heal the sick? How did he set the demon oppressed free? How did he do all that? Through the Father that was in him. He didn't do it by the, his own skill. He didn't do it by his own ability. He illustrated God incarnate. The principle of God incarnate. Incarnate means to become bodily for God to become bodily. Let me tell you my definition of incarnate. You might want to write this down. God with skin on. It's when God comes in you to live and uses you as an instrument. That's why I told you we don't pray for the Holy Spirit to come because if you've been saved and then subsequently baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is here. Why is he here? Because you're here. You bring him. You're the vessel that contains him. And the third dispensation of the Holy Spirit was is that God would begin to live in you and you would go out and find people that were oppressed demonically, find the sick and lay hands on them and they would be set free and they would be healed by the power that's working inside of you. This is the ministry. It's not about me. Aren't you glad? How many we got here? 150, something like that this morning? I can get to so many in the course of a day. All of you together can go out collectively and you can reach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people through the Spirit of God that's working in you and change their life. Come on, let's say hallelujah. I love you. This is the plan. The problem in the church is, is that we didn't teach you about pursuing this ministry of the Holy Spirit. We got you saved. You're going to heaven. We patted you on the butt and said, okay, hallelujah, you made it. You're in. It's more complicated than that, people. There's more to do than just get to heaven. If the only goal was to get to heaven, why didn't God knock you in the head the day you got saved? He wants to use you as a vessel of his Holy Spirit now here on earth. Amen. This is the plan. This is the third incarnation or the third dispensation of the Holy Spirit. When I was in a feed yard man, when I was a feed yard manager, I learned a lot of spiritual things. I learned that you can be saved and still cuss. That's one of the things I learned. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Gus knows what I'm talking about anyway. I learned that, uh, I, t I said this last week, I learned that God uses the most craziest people to do incredible things. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. I use the foolish, weak things of the world to confide in the wise and the strong. And here I was a feed yard manager, and I've ministered the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, ministers getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I, I never really understood that. But <clears throat> as I was preparing this message, the Lord reminded me of a time. We had a, <clears throat> they just came out with a new system, a computer system that you could put in your feed trucks and it ran on a mem card they call it i think they've gotten where they run on rf frequency now but anyway the the deal was is you would go out and, and load up the routes for the feed truck drivers they would mix the rations 
It would track the ingredient mix to make sure that it stayed within certain parameters. It would, it would, it would automatically uh, uh, take them to the right feed bunk. It actually had a GPS system. I had a monitor in my office, and I could pull up the feed trucks, and it would show me where they were on the yard and what they were feeding. And, and if the, the driver was at the wrong pin with the wrong rasher, it would sound an alarm. We told him it would cause the truck to blow up. That really cut down on our mixing up rations. Hallelujah. <clears throat> but but the, it was incredible what this machine could do off the scale off of this truck. And I was all excited about it. And, man, we were using it and everything was working. And, and uh, one day the, the, the representative from the company, the manufacturer, came out and said, hey, get along. I said, well, it's, it's awesome. He said, let me see how you're using it. So I showed him. He said, man, you're doing 10% of what this system will do. I said, well, I was pretty proud of what we were doing. He said, you're getting 10%. I said, well, why, what are you talking about? He said, you haven't fully integrated it yet into your, all your systems. He said, this thing will reduce your corn inventory on your inventory sheets. It'll monitor all your deal levels. It will generate billing. It'll help you generate billing for customers, la da 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 He began to list all of these things. And this morning, the Lord told me, he said, the problem in the church in America is, is they have not let the Holy Spirit fully integrate all of their systems. You're getting 10% of what the Holy Spirit can really do. If you believe that, say amen. The moment that I, the moment that I took this computer system and said, I'm going to tie it into everything that we're doing, it's all going to come right off of that truck scale. We're tying it into our billing. We're tying it into our inventory uh, uh, monitoring. We're tying it all in. It's all coming off. Guess what happened? It was amazing the things that we could do. When you get to the point in your life where you're sick of being just saved and getting to heaven and ready to be free, Come on, somebody. When you want to really be free and you really want to do what God has called you to do and you want to begin to have success, they asked him, they said, how do you do the things that you do? And he said, it's the Father in me that does the works. It's the Father in me. I only say what I hear him say and I only do what I see him do. And that's why I'm successful. How many of you want to be successful? Raise your hand if you want to be successful. Where's the liars? Chad, thank you. Chad had his up down here like this. If you want to be successful, all you have to do is become fully integrated in the Holy Spirit. You have to let the Holy Spirit have dominion over all your systems. He's got to lead you and guide you in your thought processes. He's got to guide your emotions. He's got to guide your, 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 your natural life in every area. And when he does that, you're going to become extremely successful at whatever it is you do. If you believe that, say amen. So verse, verse 12 here, where was it? 14. He says, it's the Father, the Father does the works. Who dwells in me does the works. He said, believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe uh, me for the sake of the works themselves. But assuredly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, the works that I will do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do for you, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you keep my commandments, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. This is, he referred to the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you. How long does he abide with you? Forever. 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 See, this is the other thing that I run into in people. They have received the Holy Spirit. They become fully integrated in the Holy Spirit. They become immersed in the Holy Spirit. And then something happens and they have a failure. They mess up. They cuss. They get mad at work. Uh, they have a fit. Whatever. There's something that happens or a moment when the flesh takes over their life. And they're convinced then that they have grieved the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit has left them. This is so universal. Do you guys remember the Westerns? How many of you in here ever watch any Westerns? Hey, there's still a few. And one of the things was, <clears throat> like, the, the, the bad guy, he would get the jump on the good guy, and he'd be holding the gun on him, okay? And then the good guy would go, hey, look, what's that over there? And he'd look, and then he'd knock the gun, knock him down, and he'd take the gun away from him, okay? Now, the good guy has the gun, and he's holding it on the bad guy, and he's saying, man, put your hands up. And the bad guy starts laughing, and he says, that gun's not loaded. And he talks him into believing that the weapons that he has are totally inadequate and won't work because they're not effective. 
and he talks him into giving him the gun back. Have you ever seen that in the Westerns? Am I the only one? I don't know why that stuck with me the way it did, but me and Edmundo, we've seen him. Trust me, it's in there. It's good. That's what the devil does when you get immersed in the Holy Spirit and you have the weapons, the weapons to, 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 to do greater works than Jesus did. Have you thought about that? Praying for the dead and seeing them raised. Are you really kidding me? Did Jesus raise the dead? Did he say that you would do greater things than that because he goes to be with the Father and the third dispensation of the Holy Spirit can begin? Man, we're struggling with just getting by, you know, with life, just doing the most basic things in life. The devil's tacking us and running us off because he's convinced us that our gun ain't got no bullets in it. And we have the weapons to destroy the devil, the work of the devil. We have the weapons to absolutely just destroy the works of the devil in our life. But the devil convinces us that we're powerless. You know why? Because he said, hey, the Holy Spirit has left you because you cussed the other day. I want to point this out to you. I want to read this to you one more time. The Holy Spirit will come and abide with you forever. Now, I've grieved the Holy Spirit, and I bet you have too. But I have found something about the Holy Spirit. He's a big boy. He can take it. And the other thing is, he knows my weaknesses, and he'll work on them. All I have to do is repent and get back in the saddle and go again. Amen? But what I don't ever do is I don't let the devil lie to me and convince me that I'm powerless because I ain't powerless. I've got the name above every name in my life. I have the power of the Holy Ghost. The power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me. Lives in you too. I don't have to put up with addiction. I don't have to put up with being broke. I don't have to put up with the devil carrying my stuff off and attacking my family. I don't have to put up with that because I have power over it. My gun has got bullets in it, and they are lethal to the works of the devil. You will do better when you quit worrying about what it is that you've done or haven't done or what you deserve or don't deserve. You don't deserve nothing, neither do I. It's not about what we did. It's about what Jesus did on the cross. That's where our power comes from. And he empowers the foolish, weak, odd, crazy, unusual people, for the lack of running out of adjectives. And he imparts in them incredible power. How? By the Holy Spirit. But not if you don't embrace the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, I have led more addicts to deliverance ministry probably than any pastor maybe in this part of the country. I don't say that. I don't say that to brag There's often times when I go, oh, I wish someone else could do this for a while. But let me tell you this. When an addict gets delivered from an addiction, they make the greatest disciples in the history of the kingdom because they do not go back. They know what they've been delivered from, and they know that they've had an encounter with a power that has nothing to do with them and the way they've lived. It has to do with the power of Jesus on the face of this earth through the Holy Spirit. Amen? This is the third dispensation of the Holy Spirit. In Joel chapter 2, he says, The day will come when I will pour my spirit out on my people, and the sons, the children will prophesy. The young men will see visions, and the old men will dream dreams. This is the time that we're living in. We've got to get busy. Now, verse 16 says this. Verse 17. The spirit of truth... This is another term for the Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him. Now check this out. Now he's talking to the apostles now. He's not talking to uh, Billy Fred down at, uh, down at the bar. He's talking to the apostles. And he says, but you know him for he dwells with you, but will be in you. I leave you not as orphans. I will come to you. So he's saying here that this third dispensation of the Holy Spirit can't begin until he is crucified and the judgment has been mopped up off of the face of the earth and now the water has receded and now the dove leaves and doesn't come back. The dove stays on the earth. The dove begins to work through you in you to do miracles. I went and prayed for, Carol and I went and prayed for the Brummett twins. They're miracles. That those children would not exist without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Am I, am I, am I right? 
They had to depend on the word and the power of the spoken word, the rhema word from the Holy Spirit. I remember when Sarah got a word by, the, by a prophetic word that she would be a mother, and boy, the enemy attacked that every way that you can attack it. But you know what? The enemy cannot win because Jesus Christ went to the cross and was resurrected on the third day, and at Pentecost, the Spirit of God came, and the agency of God's will is on the earth working through us, and the devil can kick and scream and fight all he wants to. He cannot undo the word of God. If we will just let the Holy Spirit lead us, if we'll embrace the ministry of the Holy Spirit, if we'll say, Lord, soak me in it, soak me in it, fully integrate me, our life's journey has got to somehow get us from Passover to Pentecost. It says the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive. So before you can receive the, this, this, this third dispensation of the Holy Spirit. You have to be born again. The world can't receive it. You've got to be born again by the Spirit. Because they neither see him or know him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. They had seen the Holy Spirit working around them. They, it never occurred to them that he was about to come in them. See, the Red Sea and the Jordan River tip type two dispensations of grace in every believer of life, every every life, uh, every believer's life. At the Red Sea, you've been delivered out of Egypt. You got saved. You said you followed God's calling. Moses put his staff, the authority in the Red Sea, parted it. You walked through that baby, and you look back, and your enemies were being drowned behind you. Now you were in covenant with God. You were His people. Oh, what a great feeling! I think it's interesting the water baptism types the Red Sea experience. But where were you standing? You're standing still in the wilderness. You're in covenant with God, but you're still in the wilderness. And the first thing you look up and there's dust coming over the hill and here come the Amalekites. Hallelujah, amen. You're out there battling and, and scraping and living on manna, which is designed just to keep you alive. I thank God for manna in the wilderness. It keeps you alive. But you're not walking in the fullness of the promise. You're in a training ground. When you get saved, you enter into that great relationship with God. But it's a preparation to prepare you for the next dispensation, which is the Jordan River, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It teaches you that you have a real enemy, that you have to learn to fight, that you have to learn to depend on God for everything. And when you get to the Jordan River, then you step into the fullness of what God has for you. And now you become a power-filled believer. Luke 24, 49, Jesus told him, he said, Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Don't go anywhere, don't try to do anything until the power from on high has come upon you. Acts 1, 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He's talking to the disciples again. These are, not, these are not lost sinners. He's talking to disciples. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They were saved already. They had had the born-again experience. They had been through the Red Sea, but they didn't have the power yet because they had to wait in my quiet time this week. The Lord spoke to me. And this is a word for me, so maybe it applies to you, maybe it doesn't. But I was praying, and the Lord, and the Lord showed me. He said, <clears throat> the cross and the blood of Christ is the sacrifice. You can't come into my presence without a sacrifice. And the cross and the blood on the cross is the sacrifice for your sin, God. God. But waiting... But waiting on me is a sacrifice of your desires. You have to wait on God. Now, Pentecost has already come. The Holy Spirit's already here. I understand all that. But if you are going to really, really step into that place in him, it's going to require you to wait and pursue him. 
Waiting is the, is the sacrifice of your desire that will usher you into the presence. You know, I had to get to the point where I was so busy, I was rushing here and rushing here and rushing there, and it was having a real negative effect on me spiritually. And I told God, I said, what's the matter with me? And he said, you quit waiting on me. You're rushing from here to there to everywhere. I started getting up early, getting in the Word, leaving the TV off. I don't care that Pittsburgh beat the Bengals. I don't know anything about I'm, I'm, I'm a sports. I was a sports junkie. I still love to watch the Mavericks. When they play good. I don't like to watch them when they don't play good. So I just, put, just see how they're playing and then I turn it off right away if they're not playing good. But the truth of the matter is I had let stuff distract me from waiting on God, from spending time in a quiet place in his word and just saying, speak to me, God. I don't know, care what you, I, you know, prayer is not a one-way conversation. Prayer is communion. It's when you converse with each other. I just sat there and I said, God began to speak to me. And he said, waiting is a sacrifice of your desire. You've got to show me that you desire me more than you desire anything else, that you desire television, that you desire prosperity, that you desire this or desire that. You've got to show me that I am the thing that you're after. That only comes when you wait on it. Amen. So they, they, they got up there and they waited for the Holy Spirit to come. And when he came, he filled them with power. Now the word, Greek word for power is dunamis. And this has been a real misnomer because it's the root of our word dynamite. And a lot of preachers say the power of the Holy Spirit is like, man, it's like dynamite. You know, maybe it is, but it, it, the, 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 the literal interpretation here is not dunamis as in bang. It's dunamis as in ability. I think too many charismatics won't see some sort of an explosion when the Holy Spirit. You know what I want? I want you to come up here, get hands laid on you, and be filled with ability. Ability to do what? Ability to persevere, overcome, destroy the works of the devil, be successful in every area of your life, live free, live with peace, live with joy, prosper in everything that your hand touches. That's the dunamis that he said you will receive when the power of the Holy Spirit has come on you. That ability to live that way. How many of you want that? Somehow or another, we got to get from a spring to a raging river. The woman at the well in John 4. If you want to turn to John 4, let's just turn there real quick. You don't have to put it up on the screen because I don't even know where I'm going to go. There was a woman. Jesus is at Jacob's well and he's thirsty. In verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you don't even have a bucket. And this well's deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of the water of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, he will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Whenever you got saved, you got a spring of the Holy Spirit. A spring of living water. Now, now I, don't want you to, I don't want you to discount springs. We just came through a drought and I've been all over the Scarborough Ranch, and I'm telling you, one of the blessings about that place is there are some springs all over it. And those springs don't gush water, but they produce a little trickle even in a drought. And when you're in a drought and there's a patch of green grass and there's a little water that's accumulated and cows are watering out of it, you're thankful for it, amen? It's life-giving. These springs are life-giving, but you never get a huge amount of water. You just get enough to kind of keep life going, Amen? And he tells her, he said, if you ask me, I would have given you the living water. Now turn to John chapter 7, and a spring of living water would have welled up in you. John chapter 7. Verse 
Verse 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, this is the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers, say rivers, rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit who those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, this tabernacle celebration, I've told on this before, but it's, it's the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a celebration of the provision in the wilderness. I'm thankful for the manna. Are you thankful for the manna? But you know God didn't intend for you to live on manna forever. But Feast of Tabernacles is a celebration of God's provision while we were in the wilderness. And on the last day, the priest goes to the pool, the pool of Siloam, and they dip, dip up some water in a pitcher, and he marches to the temple, and it's a big procession, and people are singing, and they're celebrating the famous incident at Meribah when he struck, brought water out of a rock to, 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 to uh, sustain his people while they were in the wilderness. And this is what the celebration of this is. So this priest is carrying this water singing, and everybody's singing behind him. And they go to the temple to the altar, and they pour it out. It's a big thing. I know it don't mean anything to you, but to the Jews, this is a big thing. And Jesus is in this procession watching, and he's watched it until he just can't stand it anymore because he realizes that their religion has killed the truth in this exercise that they're doing. They don't even understand that the provision of God, the living water, is the rock at Meribah, and the water that came out of it was a temporary thing. The Spirit of God that's about to be unleashed on the earth is permanent. It's where your real provision comes from. I don't know what's the matter with me, God. I've just been down. You need a drink from the living well. The cure for depression, folks, is living water. It's the Holy Spirit. And finally, he stands up and cries out. He said, if any of you be thirsty, come to me, and I'll give you this living water, which is a lot better than that stuff you're carrying around in that pitcher. And out of you will become rivers. Now, remember, he told the woman at the well it was a spring. He gave her a spring. The typology here is when you get saved, you get a spring of living water, and that's wonderful. But when you get immersed in the Holy Spirit, guess what happens? That spring turns into a raging river. And now the enemy's in real trouble because you have become dangerous to him because you've got the power, the ability to do great things. He realized that their religion had killed the meaning of this, and that's why he was overcome, and he cried out, Thus he spoke by the Holy Spirit, which had not yet been given, because he had not yet been glorified. We've got to allow the little river, the little spring, to turn into a raging river. The problem with religion is it kills your religion. We talked about last week is man-made approach to God. It's doing it your way and not God's way. It kills your revelation about the Holy Spirit. The first thing religion does is it blocks your concept of the Holy Spirit and his real ministry. In Matthew 13, 14, and 15, Jesus said to the Pharisees, in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will not hear, and you shall not understand, and seeing you will not see or perceive for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their hearts, their eyes have been closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that they might be healed. A religious person cannot see the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They can't see it. God will not allow it. But this is what he said in verse 16. But blessed are your eyes for they see. And blessed are your ears, for they hear. My goal here in this discovering the ministry of the Holy Spirit is lead you to that place where you are convinced. You know, because you know, that you need another dispensation of grace to stay free, to stay healed, to stay right. And that the devil's been tearing your head off and you feel powerless. Either you have not got the gun or he's convinced you the gun's not loaded. If you have had a baptism experience where you become fully immersed in his spirit, you got the gun. Pull the trigger. See what happens. The devil will flee. Resist the devil and he'll flee. 
But if you're struggling with an addiction or you're struggling with something that you just can't shake and you've been going to church, you've been sitting in church, you've been listening to the choir and they sound great and the preacher's a cool guy and he wears an Armani suit like me. And, you know, and he's a great talker and he tells great stories. And let me tell you something, stories ain't going to get you free. It's the power of the living God falling on you like a dove. That's where I'm trying to get you to. I'm trying to get you to the point where you want that more and you want anything else. Now, let me tell you something. Responsibility with power. I want to tell you, I'm going to say this one other thing. I told the staff this this week. I'm going to move this little bush out of the way here. You, you can't. <clears throat> I want you to get this down now, okay? Power and purity are two different things. Power and purity are two different things. Purity has to do with your witness, and you can't be a witness if you're not living a pure life. Now, I'm not talking about a counterfeit life, whitewashed tomb, looks good on the outside, but full of death on the inside. That's how Jesus described the Pharisees. When you're living a life for Jesus as best you can by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're a powerful witness. Come on, somebody. You're making mistakes, but you're still getting it. The Bible says a righteous man falls down seven times, but get up again. There's only two positions for a righteous man. It's either up or getting up. Doesn't mean you'll never fall. It means when you do fall, you repent immediately, you go again under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's purity. Purity is important to your witness. You need to work on purity. Those, if, if you're in leadership in a church, that's an essential thing. You can't be living an impure life and be a leadership leader in a church. But power is something entirely different. The power is not given to those who, who, who celebrate the most purity or had the most purity in their life because now you've taken the gift and you've turned it into a reward. It's not about rewards. You didn't earn anything. The people that got baptized, immersed in, empowered by, filled with, fully integrated in the Holy Spirit were those that were thirsty. That's all he said you had to be. You had to be born again and you had to be thirsty. Come on, somebody. You don't got to be perfect. Thank God. Your pastor wouldn't have experienced it if you had to be perfect. You have to be thirsty where you go, I want more. I know there's more, and I want it. And I got more mistakes in my life, God. You know, you got some angel up there. She's already used up all of the ink in her pen, writing down all the things I've done wrong. That is a separate issue. Purity is one thing. Power is another. Because you turn the gifts from a gift to a reward. If you make it about you being morally compliant and you being perfect, and now you're entitled to the gift, guess what? You're not going to get it if that's your attitude. But when you come to the altar and you are desperate and you are sick of living the way you're living and you go, God, I can't do nothing right. Oh, I need you. You're fixing to get immersed in the Holy Spirit. They were 120 in the upper room. They were sitting up there confused, dazed. They thought they were going to be arrested, arrested and executed. And they were begging God for something. We don't understand it, God, but we need it. You're not going to understand it because you don't have the capacity to understand it. You just have to want it. Amen. How many of you are Excited about continuing in our study of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Well, I'll tell you this. The Lord has shown me that this Hill Land Vision Church, we've already ushered in the first phase, which is the natural. And now we're about to usher in the spiritual phase. And so from here, the anointing is going to flow in a lot of places. And so it's going to flow through you. And so we need to be really, really excited. I don't care about your failures. If you, really, if you don't have any failures, then you're either deceived or you're in the wrong church. That's all I got to do. Look around, folks. Anybody in here, anybody see anybody here that looks like they are important? Paul said, he said, I have noticed about you that all of you that are called, there's not really a significant or noble one among you. So that the power may be of God and not of you. If you haven't had serious issues in your life that you've struggled with, you really don't get thirsty enough. And you never get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, Carol, uh, Mandy took issue with this. I was talking to Bill Grilke on the phone this week, and I was telling him, I said, you know, my kids don't know what thirsty is. They're, they say, I'm thirsty, Dad, and they're, you know, they're, you, they want a Coke, you know. Thirsty is when you're desperate. And Mandy, I hung up, and Mandy says, hey, that ain't right. 
Remember that time we were on the Graham Ranch in the summertime and there was no wind whatsoever? And those cows got out. We had to go plumb to the other side. By the time we got back late that evening, I got to that horse tank, and I just cleaned those bugs out of the way, and I stuck my head in there, and I drank, hallelujah. I know what thirsty is, Dad. That's what she said. Spiritually, when you get, you just clean the bugs out of the way and drink because you just got to have a drink. Now you're about to receive something from God. Amen.